Thank you all for joining today for the shear that I'm giving in memory of our son, Yaakov Levy. 18 years ago today, our lives were changed forever. When Yaakov was killed in a car accident at Mosheva, while he was looking for a site for his chanechim, his campers, to be able to have a machanechutz. The following year, in memory of Yaakov, the camp built the Beit Yaakov Levi, the outdoor Beit Knesset, which is the background to the shir. And since then, every summer on Yaakov's yard site, I have given a, a shir in his memory. Very often, the entire family was present as well. And this year, because of COVID, we really weren't sure what was going to happen. Fortunately, and I want to thank Dikla Weitzner, the director of Camp Mosheva and all of Camp Mosheva, for allowing us to do this virtually this year. It is for us a, a very important event, and it is something that is made all the more meaningful by being able to do it together with camp. Because despite the tragedy that we experienced at camp, Mosheva is still very much a part of our lives and the lives of our entire family. And so again, we thank them for this opportunity. Last year, in my Yorzeit Shir for Yaakov, I spoke about the topic of theodicy, the question about bad things that sometimes happen in this world, and why, despite our desire and our search for answers, it's actually better for us to retain our humanity and not try to cross the boundary into understanding the divine. And rather to do, as Rev. Soloveitchik told us, is not, to not ask the question of why, but rather, what now? What can we do following tragedy? Nevertheless, despite that understanding of having to live with the questions, questions cause doubt. And today, that's the subject of the Sheur I want to share with you, the question of doubt, of faith, and of response. And it's important to understand that doubts are real and doubts are legitimate. In fact, just as a prologue, as Rabbi uh, Jonathan Sachs once wrote, in Judaism, to be without questions is not a sign of faith, but a lack of depth. Because the more you think, the more you realize that there are questions. This idea, however, of the legitimacy of doubt and legitimacy of these questions actually reached back to a very, very famous story in the Gemara. It's found in Shabbat, that Flamad Aleph, Flamad Aleph. It is the first full source that I provide you with. The statement of Tanur Rabbanan that our rabbis taught, that there was a non Jew who appeared before the famous Shammai, and he said to Shammai, How many Torahs do you have? Shammai responded, We have two Torahs. The written law and the oral law. I believe, I trust, I accept the fact that there is a written law, that there are the the five books of Moses. However, when it comes to this question of an oral law, I don't believe you. The non-Jew turned to Shammai and said, convert me but convert me on the premise that all I want to study is the written law. The Gemara reports that what he did was, he threw him out. Shammai said, this is illegitimate, or as Rashi explains, he threw him out with, um, with, with strength. Because we have another principle that is taught as well in the Gemara. If someone wants to establish for themselves a level of 
believability when it comes to certain halachic aspects. He wants to be what's called a chaver, chutz midvarachad. And he's willing to accept all of the responsibilities except for one. Or a convert who comes to convert, and he accepts all of the Torah except for one thing. We can't accept them. So Shammai was right. Shammai said to this non Jew, You want to convert, you have to convert 100%. You can't say, I accept this and I don't accept that. That doesn't work. However, this very same man became, came before Hillel. He read, and Hillel converted him. Yomakama, the first day after he was converted, Amarle went to this now recent Jew. He said, Lo, Aleph Bet Gimel Dalit. He started teaching him how to read Hebrew, Aleph Bet Gimel Dalit Machar Apichle. And the next day, he changed the way you pronounce those very same letters. He said, An Aleph is a top. I, I bet there's a shin. Amarle. But wait a second, said the Nanju, or the recent convert. Yesterday you said, me, said something very different to me. Amarle. So Hillel said to this person, Let me understand what's going on. Don't you, didn't you rely on what I said? The Alpen Nami so therefore, just as you were willing to say, I told you an olive, and that's got to be an olive, I'm telling you that there's an oral law, and there needs to be an oral law. Believe me about that as well. Explains Rashi. Girei, that Hillel converted this person. Hillel relied on the fact that he would find the wisdom to be able to convince this person, not just to be living a life of Torah Shebichtav, of the written, but also of the oral law. Because this scenario is not the same case that we learned elsewhere that Shammai used as the basis to throw him out, that there was one thing he wouldn't accept. Because this person was not a heretic. He wasn't denying that there was a Torah Shebaalpeh. But rather, he didn't believe, or maybe even better, he didn't trust that the oral law was divine. And Hillel was convinced that after he would have a chance to teach this person, this person would begin to believe that as well. Said the Rashash, Rushmuel Strashon, 19th century, explaining Rashi. What we talk about, this person who wanted to convert, he didn't trust, he didn't believe. Nearly, that in order for a person to be a heretic, it means they've done their homework. They really have learned and tried to understand. And after they've learned and they've understood, then they reject. But this non-Jew who was coming before Hillel, he didn't, he didn't do any research. He just didn't believe it. And therefore, that was what Hillel was about. Hillel said, listen, that after I'll teach him, he'll believe. In other words, what this Gemara, this story, and this Rashi, and the Rashash all come to teach us, is that there is a major difference between a lack of trust, a lack of belief, a lack of emunah versus a denial of something. If you're, if you're lacking, that's something that can be overcome. If you deny, that unfortunately is something that has to be rejected. Doubt is legitimate, doubt is real, and doubt is something that Chazal dealt with. And while we've all been taught, and we were all schooled in the 13 animamins of the Rambam, I believe with a perfect faith, the reality is doubt is not prohibited. My belief with a perfect faith is a goal. Denial is what's prohibited. And in fact, 
Faith is, true faith, is the ability to live with doubt. God himself actually models it. And I'm going over to source number two to Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, who wrote, the place of doubt in Judaism is very interesting because most people define faith as certainty. I define faith as the courage to live with uncertainty. We don't for a moment believe that the existence of God is so obvious and overwhelming that you've got to be crazy to believe in God. If you're looking for a life without doubt, without risk and without uncertainty, stop living because you cannot really live without taking risks. In fact, he continues and he says how the way the Torah begins in the sixth chapter of Breshit of Genesis, the Torah talks about the fact that even God doubted. That even in God is modeling this behavior for us. What Rabbi Sachs is saying is that faith, true faith, is the ability to live with that doubt. Doubt's not bad. Doubt is not prohibited. Doubt may be a sign of courage as well. Rav Cook, in his Igrot, in the first volume, and this is source number three, writes, one more important fact. Ule inyan dina, he writes, regarding the halacha. Da, you should know. That even though it's absolutely prohibited and it's an illness, a person who doubts or questions absolute faith, Chazal only referred to a person as an apikoris one who actually denies. A heretic is not somebody who doubts, who doesn't have perfect faith. A heretic is the one who actively denies. He makes a decision not to believe. And this kind of decision, this is not something you find among Jewish people. Unless that person is absolutely evil and in and, and absolute self-denial and deceit, if he's lying to himself. But the typical Jew is never going to cross that line into kofir. He will be a doubter, but he'll never be a heretic. And it says, Rav Cook, that by the way, if we're going to look at heresy in our days in a real way, and people who are heretics as real and truthful, nowadays they would always say doubt and not heresy. We could easily resolve those doubts. But those who are heretics are lying to themselves, consciously. And they claim that they know for sure that they don't believe. Even though, despite the fact that even the weakest will never get to that point. This he wrote, by the way, in 1905. And so when we talk about doubt, and when terrible, bad things happen, even if we're willing to accept them, there's still that measure of doubt that we have to deal with. Doubt is not a disqualifier. Doubt is... is often misunderstood, but doubt is not the same as the lack of faith, and doubt actually may be meritorious in one way or another. Rabbi Lamb, who just passed away in recent days, Rabbi Lamb wrote an important work called Faith and Doubt. And in Faith and Doubt, he raises a concept of what he refers to as functional faith and halachic practice. He writes, this, however, this grant of legitimacy to doubt, the idea that I've been discussing and we've been learning together, that doubt is legitimate, must be limited to cognitive faith and must not affect functional faith or halachic practice. Doubt is something that affects our thoughts, but it can't affect our actions. And his reasoning is, 
Once we violate a halachic norm and basis of a cognitive doubt, we have in effect ceased to function as believers and begun to act as deniers, not even as doubters. Because actions are very different than thoughts. If I say I'm not sure and therefore I'm not going to keep Shabbos, by not keeping Shabbos, I haven't made a statement of doubt. I violated the Shabbos, which is an action of denial. One can suspend intellectual judgment, one cannot suspend action. This is precisely the point made by William James. William James lived in the late 19th century, early 20th century, in a lecture he delivered in 1896 called The Will to Believe. He spoke about the concept that Rabbi Lamb refers to now as forced option. The forced option is you can refuse to come to a conclusion or insist that it's impossible to come to a conclusion in the theoretical sphere, such as on the question of the existence or non-existence of God, but in practice you must act as if there was a God or as if there was no God. Actions, unfortunately, don't leave room for the gray. They're either right or they're wrong. Thoughts have the possibility of the gray. There's no middle ground. An action is also a decision. Similarly, says Rabbi Lamb, in terms of our own analysis, doubt can function in the noetic or cognitive sphere of emunah. Doubt can be, when we talk about emunah, it can be in that element of thought, but not in the functional realm, in that of halacha. If, as we've been insisting, doubt can be acknowledged as part of cognitive faith and spiritually valid tension with it, then the functional commitment must be absolute. Otherwise, it reflects the utter hypocrisy of the claim for religious validity of cognitive faith. Cognitive doubt, you feel something, something happens to you, you're upset with something, you can't understand it, and it causes you to doubt, it can't cause you to change your functional faith, your behaviors. Doubt can exist, but action is binary. It's either right or it's wrong, which is something that we find actually already alluded to in a famous midrash, a midrash in Echa Rabbah, which we will be reading Echa next week, a week from today. Rav Huna, Rav Yirmiya, B'Shem Rav Chia, Bar Abba Amre. Rav Huna and Rav Yirmiya said in the name of Rabbi Chia Ktiv, it's written in Yirmiyao, that God said they have abandoned me, but my Torah and my Torah they have not kept. Halavai, says the Midrash, if only Otiya Zavu Betorati Shamaru. What God is saying is not that leaving me was the, was the ill, was the evil, it was leaving me and leaving my Torah. If only they left me. They didn't believe in me. They doubted my existence, but they kept on keeping my Torah. Their mere lack of, their mere observance of Torah, despite their doubts, even their lack of belief would have brought them back. The observance has to stay, and that's necessary. Rotor of Lichtenstein in a brief article in Jewish Action almost 30 years ago, what I received from all my mentors at home or in yeshivot was the key to confronting life, particularly modern life, in all its complexity. The recognition that it's not so necessary to have all the answers as to learn to live with the questions. We need to understand that life is not black and white. We need to understand that life is not fair. We need to understand that life has moments of great joy and moments of great sorrow. We have every right to doubt. That recognition of the doubts and the questions is life itself. A Jew can live with doubt. In Source 7, Professor David Schatz, in an article he wrote following 9-11, spoke about this very concept and where we go next. And he wrote 
And to assume that one has fathomed God's reasons in a particular case, not only that God is administering punishment, but that he is administering punishment for this or that sin is in Rev. Licht, Aaron Lichtenstein's phrase, the height of arrogance vis-a-vis -vis the Rabbono Shalomah. Bad things happen. But what's even worse when bad things happen is when people start trying to explain why those bad things happen. And so, skipping those, that footnote, no wonder the sages taught one must not speak to the sufferer as his companion spoke to Job. His friends had insisted, whoever perished being innocent. Eov, Job's friends, insisted that Job must have done something wrong, otherwise he wouldn't have suffered. You suffer, you must be punished. You must, to be punished, you must have done something evil. They had answers. We find this even today in people who are well-intentioned and completely theologically wrong. They try to say, I understand God. I know why God did this. I know why. That knowledge of why is reserved for God. We live with doubt. We live with the questions. Those words are grossly inappropriate, not only in their tactlessness, but in their substances. In fact, putting aside the offensiveness or crassness of the friend's words to Job, the book of Job is cogently read as a protest against the view that suffering implies sin. The whole concept of the book of Eo is that we don't know. We ask the questions. And skipping down to the bottom, to the last sentence, that, but it was the friends who defended God and Job who spurned their defense. Ultimately, God tells us that the friends did not speak correctly, and Eov who protested all of the evils that had happened to him, he was the one who was correct, and he had to pray for his friends. A stronger indictment of this view could hardly be imagined. We have doubts. Doubts are legitimate. Doubts can strengthen. And the answers are beyond our ability. One of the things that moves this even forward for our family and for us is that when Yaakov was killed in the car accident, it was today the second day of Av. And the third was the funeral back in Chicago. And on the last day of Shiva, we joined with everyone else. It was a very unusual day because our last day of Shiva was Tisha B'Av. On Tisha B'Av, the entire Jewish people are in mourning for the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash. And as a result of that destruction, and as a result of that communal suffering and communal mourning, our Shiva ended up being in shul with everyone else listening to Echa. And then the very next day, after Shachrit and Kinot, we went back as a family back to Camp Roshiva. And we ended Tisha B'Av in camp itself. That idea of Chorban, of the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, is very real to our, to our tragedy. Rabbi Lamb, also in an article that he wrote after 9-11, talked about the idea of sitting Shiva, the idea of mourning, and also the next steps. He wrote, we experience the same theme when a relative or a loved one passes away. One sits Shiva. We observe seven days of Avelut, of mourning. The law requires us to mourn. This is a form of Zecher L'Churba. We remember the, the national destruction in a personal way. In a sense, when we sit Shiva, we remember how things were so terrible. It's a zecher lechurba. Today on this yurt site, when we come back to Mosheva, we see the places. We see the places where our children grew up, but we also see the places of that day. On that day, the director's trailer is where I was told that Yaakov had been killed. On that day, the Melechet Yad is where I had to tell Margaret. On that day, the Beit Knesset is where I spoke to the Chanichim. 
the Sifriya is where I talk to his Chanechim, the kids on Abudah. We see it in a very real sense, even on a yard site, and it appears within a Shiva. Nevertheless, writes Rabbi Lamb, others who are required to visit the mourner of Nihum Avelim offer consolation to the mourners. The sense of loss is not unidimensional. It's not just that I've lost and Margaret has lost, we've lost a child and our siblings have lost a brother. It's the fact that when we lose, people come to us as well to offer comfort. We try to bring him or her back into normal life. We do this as a form of zecher lemikdash. Rabbi Lamb does a fascinating piece on this. He said, we have this dialectic. There are certain things we do in Jewish observance that reminds us of the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash. We break a glass at a chuppah. That reminds us of the destruction. At the very same time on Sukkot, we take a lul of all of the days of Sukkot. It reminds us of the glory that was because it used to be in the time of the Beit HaMikdash, you only had a lulav and etrog for one day, only in the Beit HaMikdash you had it for all of Sukkot. So we remember both the tragedy and the glory. There's a churban and there's a mikdash. And he says that the very same thing happens when there's a sense of mourning. There is the tragedy and there is the nichum, the attempt to comfort. We appeal to the mourner to remember the good that once was, the beauty, the love, the happiness that they attained, and thereby bring the mourners back into a state of normalcy where they can continue living later on. That's what Nichum Avelim is about. That's what today for us is about as well. It's not just remembering that tragedy, but it's doing it at Mosheva and remembering how all of our children grew up in camp and all of the things they had done in camp and all of the wonderful things that camp represented and offered to them. How does this play in with the sense of doubt? The sense of doubt is that element of the churban that we hold on to. Unfortunately, that tragedy caused us to wonder, to question, and even at times to doubt. At Yaakov's Levaya, one of the things that I said in the Hesped was, it's not fair. And it wasn't fair. That's an expression of question, and maybe doubt. But at the very same time, with that Chorban, there needs to be the element of Mikdash. There needs to be not only the halachic obligation the functional faith that Rabbi Lamb spoke of before in an earlier source, there also needs to be the, the opportunity to find comfort and rising above it. Rabbi Lamb continues and talks about the Kaddish in the very same way, because the Kaddish is that great question of why do we even say Kaddish when someone dies? It has nothing to do with death. It rather is all about God. It's an expression of belief. And yet, there is one other side to it. As Rabbi Lamb expresses, and towards the bottom of this quote, so when someone dies, we turn to the Almighty HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and we say, God, we are here to console you. We are Menachem Aval HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You lost something of your name, of the greatness of your name. You lost, you've lost something of your holiness. So we pray, may your great name be magnified instead of diminished. It may be sanctified and never desecrated. Thus, the Kaddish represents for us a double theme. On the one hand, of death, requiring consolation, and consolation itself with the hope for a future of reconciliation with the Almighty. We know that when someone dies, it pulls us in the wrong direction. The Kaddish brings us back in. We know this, and this is the powerful statement of our belief at the moments of those doubts to try to bring us back. Rabbi Lamb bases this on a famous piece that Shai Agnon had written called the Rashut Le Kaddish, which I include here, the full text in Hebrew. Above is a summary of it in English in Rabbi Lamb's own statement. 
And ultimately, it's a statement that we know that God is different. We know that a melech basar adam shiyotzeh l'milchama lo evav motzi chayelotav laharog v'leharig safeko heved chayelotav safeke no heved chayelotav. We know that a, a mortal king, when he's going to war, his soldiers go out. We don't know if he cares about them or doesn't care about them. They're being sent out to die. Avam Malkenu, paragraph two, Malkenu Melech Malcheam Lachim Akadosh Baruch Hu, but God, Melech Hafez Bechayim, you desire life. Oh, Hev Shalom, Vrodev Shalom, Go Hevet Israel, Amo. Uvachar Banu Mikola Amin, you've chosen us. Lomit Neshanu Mubin, Chashak Hashem Banu. It's not because we're great in number. We're the smallest of all nations. But because we are so few in number, God loves each and every one of us as a complete legion. There's not many people he can replace us with. One person dies, it diminishes God's people. And therefore, it diminishes God's power. His greatness. Is diminished. And therefore, paragraph three, that's why after every Jew dies, who dies, we say Kaddish. Why do we say maybe lifted up God's name, be mighty? Because we want God's name to be mighty, we don't want it to be diminished. And God's name should be sanctified in the world He created. He should be ruling. We should see God as the ultimate king, our king, and never find anything diminished. Agnon wrote this following tragedy. Agnon found a way to look for comfort within tragedy. Questions abound. However, we have to work to strengthen belief, and we have to maintain our action. And the last thing I share with you today is an excerpt of my Rosh Hashanah Drasha. Yaakov Zal died on Bet Av. Seven weeks later was Rosh Hashanah, eight weeks later was Rosh Hashanah. And on Rosh Hashanah and on Sukkot, I spoke about him. And I have spoken about him on many occasions. Rosh Hashanah, was only a few days after his Hebrew birthday. He would have been 21 years old, that Rosh Hashanah. And this is what I shared with people at Shul and what I share with you as well now. Reb Nechunya ben Hakana, Reb Nechunya ben Hakana was once asked by his disciples, how have you reached such an advanced age? Said Reb Nechunya that there are three things that can lead to long life first, I never, I never sought honor through the humiliation of others. And I never had the curse of others follow me to sleep. And and I always gave away my money freely. And while Reb Nechunya's answer contains many layers of meaning on the simplest level, what he was telling his disciples was that one's own attitude towards others and about others can actually shorten or lengthen a person's life. That unprincipled and unbridled ambition, that using others as stepping stones to success, that constant anxiety over possessions and acquisitions can actually shorten a person's life. The more I think about these three words of advice, I said then, the more I realized that somehow Yaakov had already internalized them. Somehow he knew how to give unconditional love, not only to us, but his friends and his chanichim. Somehow he knew how to always make others feel important and good about themselves without worrying about his own honor or his own titles. And somehow he realized that giving was better than anything else. And so that's what he did with his time, 
with his energy and even with his own resources. Our son died when he was only 20 years old. And I don't want to make him into more than he was, but what Yaakov was in his own sometimes silly way was a young man who lived a full life, a life filled with accomplishments and filled with the beauty of family, community, and Torah. If only we are all Zohar to such a life, a life that made a difference for good, a life that in so many ways was a fulfillment of the prayer of Chayim Arukim, not only a life of length, but of depth. And on this first day of Rosh Hashanah, I plead with you. I plead with you through the example of a very precious young man. In this coming year, do the same with your lives. Add life to your years, and may God add years to your life. Yaakov Zal died 18 years ago, and it's very hard to imagine that it was so long ago. On the other hand, in the course of the 18 years, there have been a lot of Yaakovs that have come into this world. And there are a lot of people who were touched by his life, and continue to remember him. And we're very grateful that so many of you are joining us today. We're so very grateful that Mosheva continues his memory, whether it's through a tree that grows that was planted by Leroy Swanson, by the caretaker on the front lawn of the Bayit. It used to be a little sapling, and now it's getting a little too big. Or the Beit Knesset, or some of the crazy customs he established that when I'm at Moshe Vav for Shabbat still drive me as crazy as they did as when he created them. And I have a feeling that most of the kids don't even know where they came from. But the reality is that with all of the questions and even with the doubts that sometimes come to the fore, the one thing that we continue to learn from Yaakov and continue to pray for ourselves and for everyone is that what we learn is not that the questions exist, but that the answers are found in our continual observance of those things that he held precious, Torah, community, and family. And that those three things provide meaning in the course of this unfathomable tragedy that we live through and continue to live with every day. May his memory continue to be a blessing. May Mosheva continue to teach our children well next year in person. And I thank you all for joining us for the shir in memory of Yaakov. It is very meaningful for us, and I hope that this added a piece to your day as well of Torah that also gives you something to think about. Thank you very much.